Well, welcome everybody to an April version of Scoliosis World. Of course, I am your host, Dr. Mark Morningstar, and I'm here with a very special guest today, uh, my best friend in the world and a very longtime colleague. Um, he and I have known each other since uh, we were nobody, and uh, well, probably we're really still all are nobody, but um, I've known him for a long time, and uh, this is the guy who essentially stirs the scully smart drink if you will um he guy is the guy that works tirelessly night and day to to do all the things that we do for us uh and for all of you watching um i'm going to interview him on the podcast today and i'm asking him all kinds of stuff that he is entirely unaware of so i'm going to blindside him on every possible uh question and uh, just kind of give you a background, uh, you know, why Scully Smart started, uh, what was the need for it, to what kind of holes are we trying to fill in Scully Smart management, uh, what kinds of things are we, uh, at least the stuff we're willing to divulge that we're kind of looking towards here in the future together, um, and essentially why we're here. And I don't get the opportunity to have him physically right here next to me that often, so on times where he's here in the office, uh, we're going to, you know, make the, the biggest buck we can, biggest bang we can out of it. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce on Scoliosis World today, my friend, my colleague, my business partner, uh, the Sultan of SWAT, the Master of Disaster, the, uh, I mean, whatever, Dr. Clayton Stitzel. Um, I feel like I'm introducing Apollo Creed here or something with all the nicknames. But um, anyhow, welcome to the show. And um, let's get right into it. So April, one of the big things we're going to be talking about is Scully Smart Boot Camp and what it's for, who it's for, why it's different, why it's unique, uh, how it allows us to help a lot of people in a short period of time. And so, but before I get into that aspect of it, Let's kind of bring the audience up to speed on how we're even sitting at this table here today. <laughs> um, so first off, give the audience your background, because I don't know if a lot of people even know your background prior to Scully Smart necessarily. So let's at least start with that. Um, the How you got into scoliosis work. Uh, let's start with that. Uh, well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I hope half of that's true. It's a... Uh, <laughs> I've one learn, thing I've learned is uh, definitely a fine line between being famous and infamous. For and sure. One that's often crossed. Anyway, uh, in regards to me, uh, I'm, I'm not anyone special. I'm just a guy who uh, it wants a better way to treat scoliosis. Um, when I did my undergrad at Penn State University and got my degree in biomechanics. Uh, moved to uh, Davenport, Iowa to attend the chiropractic school there. Um, met Dr. Morningstar at that time. Uh, we both uh, had... A similar interest in a biomechanics approach to treating scoliosis that was heavily based in what's referred to as uh, reflexive response type training, which is um, really became the foundation and basis for what we're doing today, quite honestly. Um, Mark and I uh, definitely did a lot of uh, stir, stirring the pot there while we were there because uh, we also wanted a better way at that point in our careers. And uh, in reality, uh, this, uh, this idea of treating scoliosis is really almost the pinnacle um, in the chiropractic profession as well as physical medicine in many ways just because there's been so little advancement in the treatment of scoliosis and it's such a there's such a great need for an updating of the approach and I think it's one of the things that definitely attracted both of us to this uh, this course of work for sure a hundred percent I mean you gotta understand and, and we're actually gonna be having a new book on this launched here in the coming months but the idea is scoliosis treatment really has been the same since Moses was an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> and the problem with that is that there's really no new advancement. I mean, a, a child either has a brace or they don't. And if it gets bad enough, they have scoliosis fusion surgery or they don't. And then that child grows up to become an adult with a curve and nothing is done for that adult. Go live your life. If you have pain from it, we'll give you pain meds. We'll put you on pain management stuff. We'll give you epidurals. We'll send you to PT stuff that's not designed to treat the inherent problem. And like you hear me say every single week on this podcast, there is a lot more to a curve than just the curve. And if all you're doing is physically treating the curve, you're really only treating the primary symptom and you're not really getting to the root cause of why the curve is even there 
or at least why a very mild curve progressed to a point where physical treatment is now necessary in the first place. So um, to Dr. Stitzel's point, that's really why uh, we both got into this is just because there's such a gaping hole in the management of people who have scoliosis because it's it, scoliosis is a lifelong thing. I mean, it's not something where, you know, I take an antibiotic and tomorrow or the next week I'm better and I don't have to worry about it anymore. This is a lifelong thing. And if you don't manage it appropriately, it will come back to haunt you. And it does for virtually everybody if they don't manage it appropriately. No, and, and that's another key component. And, and I know we really have two types of uh, individuals who are approaching us on a regular basis for help with their scoliosis condition. We, we have the mothers who are, are seeking uh, better treatment options for their children and also the adults who um, are come to realization that this is a lifelong journey and they need a plan. Right. And, uh, you know, those are two very different populations of patients, and, and we need to be able to uh, respect and understand the journey where they are in life and where they are with scoliosis. But on top of that, we need to be able to offer solutions that are going to be appropriate for that stage of life and where they are. Um, uh, you know, it's very hard for a mother or a daughter uh, uh, who's 12 years old to hear this is a lifelong journey. So we're really creating a plan for them that's going to get them through those growth years, try to uh, to to prevent that further progression, reduce the curve as much as possible, and, and provide them that opportunity to, to have a non-invasive treatment option that's going to be effective and still allow them to maintain a very high quality of life through their teenage years, which, you know, I think this goes understated sometimes in the treatment of scoliosis is that this is the time in a child's life where they're going to be developing a lot of social um, friends and, and habits and, you know, during memories for the lifetime. I mean, the type of things that your childhood memories a lot of times occur during this period, and, and if you are in a brace 23 hours a day or, or that sort of thing here, that's really going to take away a lot of that opportunity for that child to make those lifelong memories and, and those social type connections, and that, that really can't be ignored as part of the treatment process. Regarding the adult patients, um, again, different stages of life require different uh, facets of treatment for the condition of scoliosis, but most of the adults, and I'm going to guess around age 35 or so, start do believe, seeing that um, this is a lifelong journey and they're going to need a plan because if they don't have one, scoliosis will make a plan for them. And that's where we're also a little bit unique in the sense that we've recognized that's a need and a growing need within the adult population. And uh, we're able to put together a, a plan going forward for those individuals rather than just kind of manage the condition. We can kind of stay ahead of it and provide them opportunities. Absolutely. So, so to circle back a little bit on history, so... Give us your background, if you would, or for the audience. I know your background, obviously. What is your background? I mean, in your opinion, why was the idea of Scully Smart even necessary? Uh, that's great. Uh, so I got involved with treating scoliosis, um, believe it or not, because I actually started dating a girl who had scoliosis. And um, it really took the condition from a clinical lecture setting for me uh, into a very personal level. Um, because I could see how um, it impacted her life, how it impacted every aspect of her decision making, and it really made it a very personal mission for me. Um, I got involved with a, a nonprofit organization that was doing some new and interesting things, and um, my interest in her didn't work out, but my interest in scoliosis remained. And uh, from there, I was working with that nonprofit for quite a while. Um, they became kind of concerned with some of the leadership there and decided that it was probably not a good fit for me anymore. Um, a few colleagues from that group and, and I got together and contacted Dr. Morningstar and we decided that when we put together what he's been working on, what we've been working on, we actually could create the most comprehensive approach for treating scoliosis that quite frankly the world's ever seen. And the real breakthrough here was when we kind of wrapped our heads around the idea that scoliosis is more than just a curvature of the spine. And when we started putting together these pieces of treating the whole curve, uh, whole condition, not just the curve, it really opened up a whole new world of possibilities in terms of genetic variant testing, um, neurotransmitter testing, hormone testing, the nutrient therapies that are related to those, as well as treating the condition more like a neurohormonal condition and monitoring the impact that has on the curve um, as a metric of success. Absolutely. So all of that is to say the podcast Cliff Notes version of all of this is that uh, we're together now. We've been together since, what, 2013, sure. 2012, 2013, something like that, for a little while. 
And we've been able to really uh, dramatically accelerate the progress made in a lot of aspects of scoliosis management, especially those concerning the side that have nothing to do with the, the spinal curve directly, like the different hormone imbalances, different genomic variants, different neurotransmitter disruptions, differences in bone density. There are, there are so many other things going on that have to be dealt with if you want to have a chance of not only making an impact on the actual curvature itself, but having any chance that the physical treatment you're doing on that curve has any kind of staying power, any kind of lasting impact. And the only way that happens is if you remove the impetus as to why that curve is there in the first place. Otherwise, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter if you fuse titanium rods to your spine to treat the physical curvature. If you don't get rid of the impetus as to why it's there in the first place, it's going to continue to increase over time. And we see this routinely. We have adults that come in that are bringing their child or their children in to see one of us. And the, the parent themselves are fused. And they're here because they want to prevent that for their son or daughter. And in talking to the parent, what you find is that their curvature has itself increased over time. So, for example, if you give a spinal fusion enough time, the actual curve measurement will start to very slowly and steadily regress back to what it was nearly preoperatively, or at least within a handful of degrees. And so the, the sort of dirty little secret with spinal fusion surgery is that it doesn't last forever either if you don't get rid of the underlying things as to why it's there in the first place. The physical treatment becomes irrelevant on a long-term basis if you don't address the underlying reasons as to why the curvature is there in the first place. Now, all of that said, because as you know, I, I pretty much harp on those things every podcast, and this one I suppose is no different, but today's focus of this podcast, since I only get... Dr. Stitzel here every once in a blue moon, is I want to talk about boot camp itself. Because this is really kind of the cornerstone of what we do from a physical treatment perspective. Um, and it allows us to work with kids from all over planet Earth uh, in reality. Um, and so we're going to we kind of go into a little bit of that on this podcast to explain what it's for, what's the intended purpose, how do people get started, how can people who want more information get that information, and so on. So First off, the I'll, add Dr. I'll ask Dr. Stitzler. So on in boot camp, the first off, how many patients have you treated? Like how many countries are you up to? Do you even know? Oh, I don't keep track of that. I don't know. I uh, I've I've had kids from every continent other than Antarctica. Yeah, so I would say I all over, much. right? Yeah. There you go. So what uh, in your mind at a boot camp at your office? Let's say mm -hmm. child comes in, and what's kind of the typical? Uh, expected routine that that mom and dad can kind of plan on being through while their child is there. Sure. Well, and again, every patient has their own individual treatment protocols and things for their boot camp. I mean, scoliosis is not mass produced, and neither can be the treatment. However, there's definitely is a routine, if you will. Um, you know, we do a lot of introductions in the beginning and get that first baseline X-ray uh, from the beginning here, and then we immediately start them um, on treatment right away. We our patients, we want them to be actively engaged. You know, there's a whole lot of um, anxiety and and fear in the beginning of the unknown right and we want to For try sure. to right we want to start moving through that particularly right away so the best way you can do that is just to start getting them involved in the treatment and actively participating so that they see and realize it doesn't hurt it's it's not hard to do um, it's not embarrassing it's not a big deal um, so the more you let them sit there in that waiting room the greater the anxiety grows so we want to get them active and moving and going in and, and succeeding right away um, then the first day we're doing a lot of just kind of explaining, a lot of just kind of letting them kind of uh, get the feel for things. Um, again, overcoming that fear of the unknown, letting them uh, struggle where they need to struggle so they get a little bit of life experience so that, that they get through that learning curve as quickly as possible. Uh, that first night we're going to send them home and, and, and get them uh, to, to kind of just absorb it all and take it all in. Um, that next day when we come in, uh, it's a lot of the same type of things. Um, this time we give them a little bit more opportunity to do it on their own and become a little bit more self-sufficient. And, uh, and by Wednesday, uh, generally, um, we're seeing that patients are able to almost do it all on their own. And it's amazing to watch a, a 10 or 11-year-old take that kind of personal responsibility and become that self-sufficient. And, and, and for parents, it can be very difficult because this condition tends to affect um, children at an age that are just starting that transition from a kid to a teenager. And, and sometimes it's hard for the parents to, to let go and let them 
start doing things on their own. They are sure. so used to doing I things. I hear you. I have a teen, a teen now as of a month ago here. So yeah, I right. Get it. I get it. So there's a little bit of a struggle, just even in that transition. Um, and, and parents need to, it's sometimes hard to explain to these parents, these kids are so much stronger than you realize. These kids are so much more capable. They will rise to the occasion. And I, I, we want to give these kids an opportunity to be a warrior, you know? And uh, so we, we really let the kid go out there and kind of let them succeed. And it's really hard sometimes let the parents um, not want to do it for them. But we encourage them to let the kid uh, kind of take this journey on their own a little bit. And we're there to help and support. Um, at the end of the day, we can't do it for the patient. They're going to have to be able to do it on their own. Now, the one thing that every younger kid wants to be is an older kid. So what we found here is the number one way of motivating these younger kids is to uh Praise them publicly. Public praise is the number one motivator. And the one thing I'm like, hey, I really appreciate how mature you're being by taking responsibility for doing these rehab exercises and doing them so well. You know what? It's really cool to see you grow up right here in front of us. That's really a neat experience for me. And kids love that, um, especially if you do it, you know, within their parents' ear, within earshot. <laughs> for sure. For so, sure. Uh, but on Wednesdays, um, on Wednesdays is when we, after treatment, we shoot our first, uh, what we refer to as an in-treatment um, training effect x-ray. And what we wanted to do, we wanted to determine uh, what effect is this uh, treatment and rehab having on this patient so far. Um, not that we're expecting to have scoliosis uh, kind of figured out within three days and certainly not a permanent uh, lasting result. But it gives us a really good sneak peek on how effective the treatment's being, uh, everything's working the way we expect, um, do we have enough weight, not too much weight, all that kind of stuff. It allows us kind of to hone in and, and, and make sure that they're uh, tweaking their program to maximize their benefit. It's also very encouraging to a lot of parents and patients uh, because it's, it's reassuring that this is working. Um, and quite frankly, to a lot of our patients and, and their parents, this is the first positive x-ray report they've ever gotten since the diagnosis of scoliosis. For sure. So what do they kind of do then, explain? The so families here this week. Of course, we have you know kids here this week during boot camp. You've gotten to see some of our kids. Um, explain what the typical follow up process is. So I'm mom and dad. I do boot mm -hmm. camp. Now what? Well, yeah. So we go through the boot camp program and we get them. You know, we really have three goals for that patient during that boot camp time. We number one, get momentum. Right, get this thing moving in the right direction quickly, fast now. Okay. Number two, train the patient to be self-sufficient experts in doing their home rehab because they're going to have to continue to do that home rehab on a you know daily basis for at least four to six months. Obviously, you can't fix scoliosis in five to ten days, so they they need to continue to do it on a regular basis, on a daily basis for at least four to six months to start establishing a new posture memory. So eventually, that becomes the new normal, and their brain learns how to hold their spine in a less twisted left curve position automatically. Um, so once they're done with the boot camp, then they're on that home rehab program on a daily basis. We encourage the patient, uh, the parents, to send us uh, pictures or questions or anything like that on email to make sure that that the suits, you know, they're, they're using it right and they're doing the rehab correctly. So there's a lot of support online and things like that for the parents. You're not on your own just when we're done with the boot camp process. When they come back. Um, for that four to six month reevaluation, we really encourage them to, in most cases, to, to do what we refer to as a two and a half day boost program, which we come in, we do a reevaluation x ray, um, and then we make any changes, um, updates, things to their program based on what that's telling us. And it gives us an opportunity to regain momentum, um, to also work with that patient on, on a emotional, psychological focus, because a lot of kids are, are busy and and, uh, you know, we've been out of it for a while, and the, sec the scoliosis support kind of takes a second back seat to dance class and everything else. Um, and the third thing is, while the kids are working really hard and doing a really good job, and we really actually have a very high compliance rate with our home rehab, um, they do tend to develop some sloppy habits uh, with the rehab, and that gives us an opportunity for two and a half days to kind of coach them up a little bit and make sure they're yeah. getting the most out of their rehab. Well, if nothing else, most of them are bigger since we last saw them. So a lot of times, I mean, you're trying to retool the equipment right, sure. entirely based just on their physical size and so on. So obviously the, the periodic follow-ups are always necessary, especially if you're starting with a child. You know, we have children that start as early as six years old in some cases, depending on their physical ability to do the treatments. So obviously a, a six-year-old in terms of physical stature is far different than a 15 or 16-year-old. So you kind of have to monitor them and manage them all the way through that period of time because, frankly, as long as there's growth remaining, the curvature still has an opportunity to get worse. And growth typically always has a negative impact on curve progression, especially, like Dr. Stitzel saying, if some of your home routine gets a little bit... Uh, uh, sloppy, as he says, or you just, you know, you just get out of the habit. I mean, life happens. I mean, we're all humans, right? So 
all of us need a foot in the butt once in a while in terms of external motivation because we can't all be 100% self-motivated 100% of the time. And so it's nice to have somebody looking over. I mean, even, even pro athletes have coaches. Even, you know, everybody has somebody to be accountable to in order to maintain compliance with whatever it is he or she is trying to accomplish. And the nice thing is that I think uh, the really cool thing to kind of piggyback off of what Dr. Stitzel was saying is that the parents have an opportunity when a child is here at boot camp, parents also get the opportunity to kind of learn along with that child. And so the entire family, in essence, now starts to have some skin in the game, so to speak, to where uh, we're not necessarily just teaching that child how to do his or her exercises. We're also teaching mom and or dad how to do those same exercises. And, and that way, the more the family is aware of what's going on, the more the family knows how to do everything, generally, the more compliant they are. And that's really no different than, uh, in a different example, somebody who has to be gluten-free. For anybody out there who has tried doing any of those kinds of things, you know that if, let's say you have a son or a daughter who needs to eat a gluten-free diet, but yet you're they're a single person in a household of six or five, and they're the only one who has to be gluten-free. Well, guess what? If the whole family doesn't go gluten-free, that child's not going to be gluten-free for very long. They, they just aren't. So the nice thing about boot camp is it encourages the entire family to kind of dive into the process in totality. Uh, and, and I think that's really what kind of separates the compliance. Plus, like Dr. Stitzel was saying, most of these kids are fighters. And most of these kids, you know, they have something that um, psychologically impacts them. And to give them the ability to overcome that is very empowering to them. And so it's nice to see kids blossom personality-wise. Because one of the things we know going well beyond the spinal curvature itself is that Kids with scoliosis, given their often abnormal neurotransmitter ratios, have issues like with introversion, have issues with not necessarily a full-blown depression, but lower mood, lower, lower levels of self-esteem, and so forth. And so anytime they can kind of break through those obstacles and barriers and, and do what they want to do and accomplish what they want to accomplish, it changes them. And if nothing else, in many ways, that in and of itself justifies doing the therapy. Because it now sets them off lifelong to just be on scoliosis. I mean, just tackle life. I mean, grab life by the throat and go. You know, don't wait for everything to happen to you and make an excuse for everything. And this boot camp gives people the opportunity to take control. And yes, it's exercise. And yes, frankly, in my opinion, nothing that's worth doing is easy. And boot camp is not easy. I think Dr. Stitzel would even agree with that. It's not easy, but that's why it's so rewarding for these kids who accomplish it and go through it is that they have really actually done something and accomplished something. Uh, it's not just, okay, I wear a brace 23 hours a day and you know I'm a human jello mold. That, that's really not how it works. There's so much more to this than that. And boot camp is a very hands-on process. I mean, kids have to be individually managed, robustly managed, and they have to be managed longitudinally, especially if I have a boy. I mean, the reality is if you have a son with scoliosis, for example, and they initiate scoliosis boot camp therapy, let's say at 10, 11, 12 years old, in reality, they may not be done growing until they're 18, 19 years old. And you have to manage them all the way through that period of time. They're, they will hit, inevitably, boys hit a late stage growth spurt at 18, 19 years old, and where now they shoot up a couple of inches between say, at the end of their senior year of high school and freshman year of college. Happens all the time. You have to monitor them all the way through growth. And that's what the boot camp allows us to do. So even if that child goes off to, you know, I'm in Michigan. So if I have a patient who comes to see me from somewhere in Louisiana and they go to LSU for college, well, they can still come and see me on breaks because they're only coming for short periods of time. So it allows us to manage people from, like Dr. Stitzel said, every continent on planet Earth. And, you know, we could probably do a few penguins too from Antarctica if we need to. But um, we can manage people from anywhere because the way boot camp is structured, it allows us to manage people from everywhere successfully. You know, circling back around and reinforcing the point you made about leadership comes from the top. And a lot of these uh, children who are, you know, again, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, they're taking the cues from their parents. And if this is an important aspect to the parents, it's going to be important to the child as well. They're, that, so, you know, I can't en emphasize strongly enough that parent involvement is a critical part to the kid's success of this whole program. It's not a five or ten day effort. It's a multiple year effort. 
and you know we can we can come back and, and re-engage treatment um, over and over again but it's really what is being done in between treatment sessions that's going to have the most long-term impact on that patient both uh, physically and emotionally and mentally for sure we're guides and we're guides in that point in time i yeah. mean you the horse has still got to drink the water right we're just a coach that's right that's right so anyway, so it's April, obviously, um, and every month Scully Smart has some kind of a, a promotional thing we have going on. So I want to make sure I plug that. So the one thing we always do is, um, being that this month we're really talking about boot camp, for anybody out there listening to this podcast who is interested in boot camp, it's easy to get started. I mean, easy, easy, easy peasy. All you got to do is call and you can get a free x-ray review with one of us. We have Dr. DeVorne out in San Diego. Mm -hmm. We have Dr. Sid up in Manhattan in New York. And you have Dr. Stitzel, myself. Um, you can speak with any of us on the phone. And all you need to do is upload. You go to scullysmart.com, upload your x-ray, and you will be directed to the clinic that's closest to you um, for a free phone consult. And we'll tell you right away, is your child appropriate for boot camp or not? Not everybody is. So in the interest of not wasting your time or ours, it allows us to determine if your child is a candidate or not without having invested any time or money, really. That way we can really focus since each of us has a finite amount of clinic time because we can only see so many kids in a given week that we really try to pick the kids who are going to be the best candidates. I mean, that really at the end of the day, that's what it's about. And so if there are treatments that we can do and that we can offer, then we can discuss what those treatments are during that phone consult and what kinds of things might be right for you or your child. So uh, if you're interested, again, all you got to do is go to scoliosmart.com or treatingscoliosis.com. They both get you to the same place. Uh, upload your x-ray. And what are the, the x-ray requirements for the last uh, so many months or something like that, right, for a kid? I mean, preferably with an x-ray within six months. Yeah, and then uh, an adult, I think we give longer than that. We give a couple of years, years or something. Three to five yeah. years for yeah. an adult, yeah. So as long as you're an adult with an x-ray that's five years old or newer, we're good to go. We can go off of that x-ray. Uh, we have adults all the time that even do that process for the scoliosis activity suit, uh, which is a very hot commodity and probably one of the biggest standalone treatments that we offer for adults. So um, we have the ability to help a lot of people in a lot of ways. Like I said, boot camp is really kind of the cornerstone of the physical treatments that we provide to people. Uh, but we like to make sure we screen everybody to make sure that everybody is a really good candidate. And when you call, just bear in mind, look, we're going to ask you things like, what is your child's history of a curve? You know, give us the background. Has they been recommended for surgery yet? Are they following with an orthopedic surgeon? Do they see a chiropractor? Do they do other alternative treatments for their for his or her curve? Uh, have they done any kind of genetic testing or anything else? Are there other genetic syndromes to consider? So there are all kinds of factors that we kind of work through during that free phone consult to allow us to establish whether or not you or your child is an appropriate candidate. So this phone call is very important, but most importantly for you, it's free and it's always free. And so uh, again, the reason why we're doing this in April is because essentially for all four of our clinics, the summer schedule fills up quite quickly because the vast majority of all of our patients are seen essentially from you know second week of June through Labor Day. So um, the sooner you can get in your free phone consults for the summer schedule, the better. Uh, anything, anything more to add? Well, no, and, and, and you know, yeah, absolutely. And, and again, about the patient selection aspect, you know, one of the secrets we have to uh, having a very high success rate, in addition to having a very comprehensive program that's very effective, is patient selection. Uh, we only take cases that are good candidates for what we can do. No one wants to take on a case with a high expectation of failure. We're going to get the right patients to the right place at the right time for the right procedures. And, I mean, that's why we're successful, and that's why we have so many people who are very satisfied and happy customers with what we're doing, is because we're dedicated to making sure that we're taking only cases that are you know appropriate for our, our approach. Absolutely. And I, and I think, and along with boot camp, one of the things that we're always going to typically recommend as well is, there may be things, especially as we get to talk with you on the phone more extensively and individually, there may be things like genetic testing, like hormone testing, like neurotransmitter testing. There are other things that we can sort of gauge very often, even right on that initial phone consult to say, is there something else from a non-spinal perspective that we're also going to have to address for you or your child's particular case? To allow us right away from day one to really kind of establish that, look, this has to be a robust management strategy if we want to have the best chance for success, especially 
For example, if we have an adult with a degenerative form of scoliosis, for example, let's say a a 55-year-old postmenopausal female where bone density now might be factoring into their curve worsening or things like that. There are a lot of other things that we have to consider rather than just, you're going to come to boot camp, you do the exercises, and then you know see every six months, have a nice life. It it's, goes way beyond that. So that initial phone call really allows us to acquire a lot of information about that individual case so that we can make a good decision as well. Because again, we don't want to take on, like, he, like Dr. Stitzel saying, that where we really think they're going to fail because at the end of the day, yeah, this is what we do. And this is what we eat, sleep and breathe every day. But at the end of the day, we're human beings and most of our patients are kids. And if I'm not the right person to help that child, and I really don't think I can, I want to get them to the right place. He wants to get them to the right place. Sid and Brian probably want to get them to the right place. <laughs> I mean, I'm speaking for them being tongue in cheek, being funny, but at the end of the day, we just want to help. And, but we recognize that there's a lot of research published worldwide out there that doesn't take, that a lot of providers aren't taking into account, meaning information on bone density differences, micronutrient deficiencies, hormone imbalances, neurotransmitter disruptions, all of these other things we know 100% of the time occur in scoliosis to varying degrees. Nobody's doing anything about them. Nobody knows how to do anything about them. Nobody wants to do anything about them. So we're kind of on an island here as far as our management strategy is unlike anything else out there because we're trying to account for all of these other things, things that nobody is even interested in. Or, you know, you, you talk to a, a, a provider about uh, if I'm only interested in doing surgery and you start talking to me about your estrogen levels, my eyes are probably going to roll back in my head because that's not what I do. I'm a surgeon. I get that. We're kind of hybrid trained. We're kind of the black sheep of the medical community. I get that. And that's okay with me. And I'm sure that's okay with him that it allows us to treat you as an entire person, not just as a curved spine that came floating through the door at the end of the day. It all starts with that free phone consult, period. We don't charge for it. It's just information. Do with it what you will. It allows us to determine if we can help you beyond a reasonable doubt and we go forward or we don't, but at least you have all, all that information free of charge and it allows you to make a very good, well-informed decision. It allows us to determine if we can help or not, or at least if we can't, we can get you to the right place. Well, I like to refer to it as straight answers for crooked spines. <laughs> there we go. So final plug of the day, I guess. Anyway, um, the anything uh, on the horizon for May or June or any anything you can uh, add? for upcoming promos beyond April? You bet. Lots of them. Stay tuned. Yeah? All right. <laughs> All right. Very good. Well, anyhow, um, again, this is Dr. Clayton Stitzel, basically uh, the brains behind the operation here. I'm just the pretty face behind the podcast. So uh, anyhow, uh, tune in May. We're actually going to be talking a little bit about bone health and some other stuff. So that's going to be uh, pretty important. Stay tuned, especially all of you adult patients out there who are you know, peri- and postmenopausal females in particular. The next podcast in May is going to be directly targeted. I mean, I'm talking to you. So uh, bone health in May. Otherwise, for April, enjoy the, the nice springtime weather. Uh, happy Easter, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next time.